gentleman that was at Walmart and he got into the checkout line and there were several people they were waiting for. It's, I guess now you have to do the self-serve. So he was waiting patiently and the lady in front of him stroke up a conversation. She stared at him for quite a while. He said, what's going on? She said, well, you look so much like my son that's passed. And she began to get tearful and whatnot. And he said, I apologize. She's like, no, no, it's a good thing. She said, it's just you remind me so much of my son, even your voice. So they talked for a while, and then she finally got to her point to do the checkout. She did her thing, and she, uh, before she left, she said, and she said, you know, when I walk away, would you just say, see you later, Mom, I'll see you later. My son always used to say that. He said, sure, I can sure do that. So she began to walk away, and he said, see you, Mom, see you later. And out the door she went. He began to check out, and he rang up just a few items, and the lady said, $353. He said, what's the deal? He said, your mom said you paid for it. <laughs> oh, three of them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next reviews, I guess. <laughs> I just read them. I don't write them, okay? I've got a poem tonight called The Truth About Cowboy Laundry. Anyone have to do some pretty uh, icky laundry lately? It says, Rodney and Baxter have written some poems about laundry that they have created, but let me assure you, from the wise point of view, their descriptions are far understated. There should be a word such as Tide's Purple Heart for the wiser to put to the test of handling the filthiest items on earth and for sure the worst job in the West. Oh, it might be a prolapse or pulling a calf, whatever the job that was done, most of the remnants end up on their clothes, the urine, the blood, guts, and dung. You block all the doors and not let them come in, but none of us wives are that bold to make them strip down outside in the yard because the weather's usually too cold. So here they come in as you stand there in horror and hope that you don't have the luck of having to help them climb out of the mess, but sometimes the zipper gets stuck. On their filthy old car hearts as your mind flashes back to the time that you fell for this guy, your mom tried to warn you of a cowboy life and now you can understand why. You use a broom handle to pick up the mess and hope that it stays on the stick. It's a balancing act that can be quite a job because those garments are slimy and slick. The smell fills the house and you gag and you choke as you head for the washing machine. You're leaving a trail that drips from the clothes on a floor that this morning was clean. You dump in some Clorox, a half cup of soap, and your poor old machine goes to work. It takes several washings before they come clean. It's enough to drive ranch, ranch waves berserk. In the meantime, you're scrubbing the mess in the house that was tracked in and smeared on the floor because doing the laundry that's placed in your care is only but one minor chore. Even the broom handle reeks of the smell, and so you scrub it and spray it down good. There's blood on the doorknob inside and out, and heaven knows what's on the wood. Then fresh from the shower, he arrives on the scene, saying I'd help you if I thought it would, if I could, but the smell of that pine all about makes me croak, and you're starting to wish that he would. So if your daughter is wanting to marry a cowboy and the idea has you in a quandary, the best way that I know to help change your mind is to show her some cowboy laundry. <laughs> Isaiah 118 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, we think about life and we think about as we walk through life and gather up sins here or there, or don't go to church for a while, we can end up with pretty, uh, pretty ranky clothes and lots of dirt on us too. But Jesus Christ, because of the cross, cleanses us from those sins. So we have a blessing in that. Anyone ever do clothes like that? A few hands go up. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, think about that next time you're doing that process. You know, I was kind of thinking uh, uh, today, I think off the wall sometimes, that, like kids, you know, when you talk to kids, you talk like baby talk, so you wonder how they ever learn to talk, to talk. And it's the same in Minnesota as you walk, because in, in the fall, you're kicking leaves, so you walk like that, you know, you're having lots of fun, and then in the winter, you're kind of walking through the snow, trying to get to the house. Then the ice comes, and we're walking like this. And then the dirt comes, like it's starting down there now, and you walk for a little bit, and then you kick, and you try to get your shoes off. How does a kid ever learn to walk in Minnesota? It's always a weird kind of walk. Every season has its own, so I've just... Anyone ever ponder that? That's why I'm up here. <laughs> There's only one of me. 
Thank God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so next sermon is titled, He's Waiting to Hear From You. He's Waiting to Hear From You. How many of you have ever seen the movie Fargo? Yeah, no one wants to admit it. I think a lot of us watched it because we heard about the accents and we heard about how they made kind of fun of us or whatnot. And so you watch the movie and there's a lot of interesting parts. Just to let you know, it says all over the movie it's true and they haven't changed anything. And that's all lies. That's the, I read a story about how they just put that on there to make it more enticing. But they have words like this. They say things like this. Have you ever heard this? Like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh my, oh my, gee. Yeah, 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 betcha. Anyone ever hear those kind of things before? Mm -hmm. Well, don't you have, if you watch the movie, don't you think they kind of overdo it a little bit? Are we really sound like that? Do you think so? I hope not. I really hope not. But I can tell you this. I, uh, when I was in 4-H, I went at like 19, we went down to Washington, D.C. to the National 4-H place. They have like, they had bought an old college campus. And so they would take, every year, take uh, people from the states all over. We'd come down there and gather together and have conferences and go to see some of the sites and whatnot. And so I went down there and it was late at night and they put me in a room with guys from Kentucky and South Carolina. And so as I began to listen to them, I chuckled to myself because I thought, man, you guys talk funny. So I sat and listened and just, it was humorous or whatnot. Finally, I was talking with some of the guys and they said, you know, can we tell you something? You talk funny. <laughs> and I said, how do we talk funny? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. And so this whole idea of communication is kind of where we're going to start out. The, the world is full of all kinds of communication. A lot of times we struggle to communicate our wants or needs with different people. Sometimes it's because of the language or whatnot. It might be that we can't speak or those sort of things, that we're deaf or whatever it might be. But we come to realize that there's a lot of different languages, and so it's often hard to communicate with people. If you don't realize it, in the United States, it's getting more and more pervasive. I believe in the... Like 2018, there was like 350 different languages spoken in this country. And now there's 450, I think it is. So there's a huge diversity of people from all over the world. And even in different countries, have different dialects. You can go down south and they have kind of French Creole. And you can go into Mexico and they speak different than they do in San Antonio or whatever it might be. But you realize that there's a lot going on. And we are 25 miles from probably the most diverse little town in the world, Pelican Rapids. They have uh, people from all over the world there. You can go shop about different foods from all over the world down there. Um, it's the, I looked it up, it says it's one of the most diverse school systems in Minnesota. They have to have several interpreters of several different languages because we have kids coming in from all over. They have the Caucasian, they have Hispanics, they have Kurdish, they have Russians, Somalians, Scandinavians like us. They've all mixed together and they're in this one school, a small school district, so they're struggling to try to help these students learn how to read and write in English and whatnot, and even to understand the rules because they don't quite get it because of communication barriers there. So if you've ever tried to talk to someone uh, from a different language, they're as frustrated as we are. It's not that we're right or they're wrong, it's that we can't communicate very good. So there is a diversity in language. Now, why is that? Where did that come from? Well, it came from the Bible. If we go all the way back to Genesis, we're going to go to Genesis 11, 1 through 6. God created many languages. This is the Tower of Babel, if you remember the story. I want to read this to you. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. Keep that in mind. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, usually when we preach that, we're talking about how it's all about me and I, and we're going to do this. We're not going to talk to God. We're going to build a tower as tall as God is. But now we come into the language part. It says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. So we see this changing of uh, languages scattering all over the face of the earth. And they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. We oftentimes, are you babbling? Are you babbling? Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. 
And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So you picture this city, they're trying to do this thing, and they're communicating well, because they're communicating so well, it's happening. And the Lord says, you know what, we need to stop this. And so he changes languages, we find languages from all over the place, and then he ships them all over the world. And we see where we get people in different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and we sometimes have wondered how that took place. Well, God had a hand in that for sure. But we come to realize that God is the orchestrator of the different languages. Hmm. Again, in 2018, there was 350 languages spoken in this country. Currently, there's 430. So, a lot of people get frustrated trying to learn our language, and we get frustrated that we want them to learn our language. And, you know, when you get on the phone, it's dial one for this, dial two for that, or whatever it may be. But our ancestors, they really only spoke Norwegian, or German, or English, or Swedish, or even the Irish in the late 1800s after their potato famine changed their Irish language to an English language. And so even us, our Scandinavian or Scandinavian uh, ancestors came here not knowing how to speak English, most of them. So I just say that because we've got to have a little bit of grace and mercy for those that don't know how to speak English. And we say, how dare they be in America and not be able to speak English? Our ancestors couldn't either. Okay? Just so you know that. So it's a double standard. We can't have that. We can't judge people harshly when our own people did that. We're generations down. We now can speak it well. But there were different languages uh, in different parts of the world. And what happened in the United States is people used to assimilate. Assimilate means join in, become. So people would move from all the different parts of the world, like Norwegian or Swedish or whatever it might be. Even the Native Americans had to assimilate to what the main basic was, English. They chose to do that. These days, people come to the country and choose not to do that. And that's considered okay. Back in the day, they would have said, either learn it or starve. Now, it's, it's being you know, taken care of, or they're uh, helping in a lot of different ways with signs that have many different languages on them. There's different ways to do it, too. I heard uh, Randy doing this earlier, yodeling. Where's Randy? Is he here? <laughs> Randy, just yodel for a second, would you? Yodel on command. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, yes. Yodeling. You know, if I did that, I'd get that. Yeah, I'd try. The yodeling in the Swiss Alps was a language. They yodeled because it was a high pitch and it carried a better echo. And so they yodeled to go across the mountaintops. So yodeling wasn't necessarily Slim Whitman yodeling. It was the idea that it was a language, but they turned it again into the musical part of it. There's one tribe that whistles. They whistle everything. Now, some of us were in that tribe in the summer... That we're in that tribe, as young guys were, right? But they whistle. They whistle for everything. Different uh, pitches, different tones or whatnot communicates with other people in that tribe. A professor, his name is uh, Murabin, Murabin, yeah, did a study. He said communication, the verbal words, is only 7% of our communication. 93% is nonverbal. You guys get that? You believe that? 7% is verbal. It's how we're... He says 55% of it is the body language, you know, how we carry ourselves and things like that. And the other is tone of voice. So, you know, if someone says to you that, no, that doesn't bother me, it doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire, right? <laughs> or if it's like, that's fine, no. Where would you like to go eat? Oh, I don't care. This is so Minnesota. Honey, where do you want to go eat? Oh, I don't care. Where would you like to eat? Oh, I don't care. Where would you like to eat? No, no, go ahead and pick a place. No, no, you go ahead and pick a place. All right, let's go to Burger King. We go to Burger King. She goes, oh, I like McDonald's better. Right? <laughs> That's kind of how it works. It's this polite attempt. But the point is, is that nonverbals is, they're saying, 93% of our communication. Uh, again, it's the tone of voice. And you guys, have you ever seen some different tones coming out of somebody or hearing different tones? Or their posture or how they carry themselves? Some people stand like this and you feel like they're very open. Others stand like this and you feel like there's no way you're getting through to that person. And so we realize that our nonverbals are very important. And so we realize that how we interact with people, just because we talk the words, sometimes our bodies are saying different things. But hopefully we communicate well. So just some examples like, you know, crossing the arms. Or how many of you roll your eyes and do that? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. You know, and you're like, yeah, I believe you. I believe you really. Uh, and then you see on TV when they go, well, no, you didn't. 
Right? You know that one? That's out there? Right? Yes. I hurt my neck on that one. <laughs> and so people talk about this or that, and, and then this whole communication thing of Minnesota goodbyes. What is that about? You know, sometimes it takes over an hour for people to say goodbye at this church on Sunday evenings. It's true. I won't, and we won't say the names of the people involved, but they both have the same first name. And so, Seth and I will wait. <laughs> oh, did I give it away? <laughs> but isn't it true, Minnesota goodbyes, you say, well, we're going to go now, you're at the door, okay, well, great. Then you walk with them out to the car, yeah, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they get in the car and then they roll down the window so you can talk some more, right? Unless the mosquitoes are out, they just like send them on their way. So we communicate in a lot of ways, some of it's fun, some of it's not so fun. But what we're getting to is that the prayer language between us and God is the true communication with God. Now, he looks at our actions, and the Bible says he looks at our heart. He can see where we're at in our you know, nonverbals. If we say, I love being at church, I just love it. Or I'm saved and I'm so, so proud of being a Christian and your face is like drooped over. And they say, tell your face how happy you are. Right? And so our actions can speak and God knows those. But it's this time of quiet time with us and God speaking to each other. Exalting Him and asking Him that His will would be done. And then asking that you can help in some form or fashion. And thank you for providing our needs. Thank you for dying on the cross. And you know, I, I pray for all the people that don't know you. And help me, Lord, to be able to help them come to know you. All those things, that's communication. That's true prayer. That's the only way we really communicate with God. Now, how many of us do you think don't do it near enough? You don't have to raise your hands, but I, I believe most of us don't do it near enough. Well, we pray at church, Brian, and we say prayers before our meals, and we say prayers before we go to bed and stuff. It's more than that. It's more than that. He wants a daily, all day long kind of a prayer mindset of your to be pray without ceasing, the Bible says, to, to be in communication with Him about everything that you're doing. That you can still work and pray, you can still do different things and pray, you can be in the tractor and pray, you can be just talking to God and having a conversation with Him versus maybe listening to music all the time or talking to yourself or talking on the phone. Talk to God for a while. Give Him some time. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is worth it? Do you think because he loves us enough to die on the cross, calls us his children, calls us his friend, that he would like to have dialogue with us? He wants to give us an abundant life. We only know how to do that if we have interaction with him, that he can speak what that is into our lives. And then he can speak and the Holy Spirit can speak and all of a sudden we have this understanding, we have a better knowledge. We, we pray as we read the Bible, Lord, help me have the knowledge. Bring all the nuggets of this verse to me so that I can understand how it parts in my life. And all of a sudden, the pages open up. Yeah. You've ever experienced that? Yeah. Nothing more wonderful and nothing more validates your walk with God and that communication is when He answers even those simplest of prayers. <coughs> Prayer delights God's ear. It melts His heart. It opens His uh, hand. God cannot deny a praying soul. Someone else wrote this. Prayer bathes the soul in an atmosphere of the divine presence. A day hemmed in prayer is less likely to come unraveled. I like that. Then somebody says, I must talk to the Father about this. Have you ever said that? You know, you're making a big decision or something could happen. You could buy something. Someone wants to buy something from you. You might want to move. Whatever it is. And you say, you know what? I need to take some time and talk to the Father about this. Man, if you are saying that, you're, you've got maturity to be able to say, I'm talking to my Father. I include Him in my decision making. I include him in what takes place in my life. He's my filter. Everything goes through him before I make decisions, before I do this or do that, especially the bigger decisions. I talk to God. I communicate with him. I want to talk to my dad about this first. Man, remember when you were a kid, you were going to buy a car or something like that, and they'd be talking about it, and they'd have kind of a high price or whatnot, and then you might say, just let me talk to my dad first. Because you know if you went home with this car and not asking dad, things were going to get kind of heated. Right? And so you say, you know what, I just want to talk to Dad, and most people honor that. It's like, okay, that's fine. So this whole idea of looking at Jesus Christ as our Father, because He says He is, and He says that we are His children, man, I pray that most of us have the luck in our lives and the, the fortune to be able to speak to our fathers and mothers through our lifetime. 
I don't know if some people probably have, didn't have a father, or things were strained or whatever it might be. My dad, I could talk to somewhat. Mom, I could talk to much, much more. Um, dad was more of a kind of like, mom would tell him what we were kind of looking, you know, could we eat a mini bike? And we'd go through mom, and then mom would go to battle for us. And she had a way with that that was better than ours. And so then we might get the mini bike, and then dad would come and tell us, you know, there isn't give us because mom would love that. <laughs> But we knew how the game was, and we played it well. <laughs> but I could communicate with my parents. Uh, I was blessed to have that ability to do that in, in my life. I know some of you weren't. But I don't care if you weren't able to, because you might have said, boy, I wish I could have. But now we have a Heavenly Father that you can. Every one of us can have that personal dialogue with Him all day long if you wanted. Somebody said, well, He's too busy. God's too busy for prayers. But He says... He tells us all to pray without ceasing, meaning I can, I can handle the information. I can handle the flood that's coming at me. Don't worry about it. Each and every one of you, pray all that you need. Pray more than you do, I'm guessing he would tell us. And so what's interesting, this whole idea of prayer, I think we've so minimized it and compartmentalized it, I think that's a word, uh, and made it just a small little group of who we are as a Christian. All this is Christianity, then we have our prayers that we say. But he wants to have a personal dialogue with us, in secret, in a quiet place. It's great to pray together, it's great to do those sort of things, but he wants a personal relationship with you. Now, would you like to be in a relationship if you only talk every once in a while to your spouse? <laughs> I've asked this before, and some of you said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, that will make it better. No. So how many of us would be happy in the relationship? If you think about how much you talk about with God, would you be content in that relationship if you reversed the roles? Would it be okay? Or would you say, come on, we need to have more. If we have this intimate relationship, we need to be communicating. And that's what God wants. You can never overburden Him. You can never uh, pray about dumb things. You can just share your heart. Begin to talk to Him about what your heart says, and the rest will take care of itself. I guarantee you. Because you can ask the Holy Spirit also to intercede for you, to help you to know what to pray for. Have you ever just wailed? Don't even know what to say. Just scream out, Jesus. Or, man, I've walked around here sometimes just going, Jesus, because I don't know what to even say. But I know that I need to say something. And I know the Holy Spirit intercedes for my heart, sees what I want to do and what I want to say, and helps me with that. Crosses that burden and takes care of it for me. Because I see the results of what takes place. Luke 11, 5 through 13 says this. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give it to you. Most of us would probably answer that way, wouldn't we? I say to you, though, he will not rise and give to him because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as, as he needs. And so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, and knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks the Father, or he, I'm sorry, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer up a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? I tell you what, you think about your father or your mother, and you can think of the best uh, memories that you've had, the best communicating time you've had, the best fun you've had with them, uh, the most that they've ever shown love to you, and it compares nothing to the Father, Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, why, why don't you talk to me? Please talk to me. I'm a good father. If fathers that fall into sin can be good fathers, guess what I can do because I'm sinless. I'm the creator of the universe. Just trust me and come to me. We're talking this morning about being able to have faith and being able to st stand strong, to be, uh, uh, what was the word? Convicted. To have a conviction towards Jesus Christ. To be able to stand strong in that. And that goes to our prayer life too. Or will we get lapsed of days, you on it? A lot of us have good intentions, right? Now we listen to the sermon, you say, you know what, I think I'm going to get serious. I'm going to start praying more. 
And maybe tomorrow you pour it on really good. You can get up early and make some coffee and you give God some time. And then before long, Tuesday's around, but you know what? The, the kids are having trouble in the morning, so I'm going to back that off. We were talking about this in discipleship course, how easy it is to get off track in communicating with God. Yeah. We get too busy living the earthly life than to give our God our spiritual life. We get so busy taking care of the mundane things of this world that seem so important, and they can be, but then again, we're not supposed to be in love with this world, are we? Yet, oftentimes our actions look like we are, more than we are giving Him time. He's there, we know that, but we don't interact with Him. We don't bring our needs to Him, we don't bring our praises to Him like we should. And so he's saying, please do that. If you, if you have a Father on earth that will take care of you, trust that I would do that too. When it says to ask and to seek and to knock, it doesn't mean that that's a blank check, that I can just ask for whatever I want. I, can have a, I used to want an ice castle, now it's butter. I just want this Miller Real butter, big 50,000 pound box. <laughs> I just eat my way through it. No. It's not that kind of prayer. But if it comes in line with God, if it comes in line with the plans that He has for you, if it's to help the kingdom or to move Him forward and He says it's okay and He's fine with it, He'll answer that prayer. But I think a lot of times we don't see those miracles take place as much as they used to because we don't put as much effort into our prayer life and our prayer walk so that we have that relationship. So when we ask, we know we're asking in God's name for something that God can use to do something well in my life and in the world's life. Our prayers are more superficial and quick. Not, not always. Again, the discipleship class, uh, we've been getting deeper and deeper in the idea of being disciples, and now we've hit the idea of prayer. And a lot of us admitted, you know, we could do it more, but a lot of us said, you know what, we're praying quite a bit. We're actually praying for a lot of people. We're praying for, you know, the country. We're praying we get prayer requests, or we're just, you know, pray that we didn't do the wrong thing today, or if I said anything wrong, Lord, please forgive me. So we have some things going well. But I think a lot of us are staying pretty superficial and it's pretty far and few between. Now maybe tonight will spark us to move in that direction. I, I pray it's the beginning of something. That word persistent means to be persistent. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. To have that prayer attitude all the time. To include Him in your discussion. How many of you when you're doing work think about different things? You can do two things at once, in other words. Well, just include Christ in that conversation. Maybe set some other person aside in your mind or some other situation and give God some time as you work on something that you're talking to Him about it. Thank you, Lord, for helping me find that branch. How many of you feel that Jesus Christ has helped you find your keys more than once? Now, that's such a mundane, simple little thing. The Creator of the universe who died on the cross will take the time to help us find our keys. I know it because I've seen it in my life many, many times. He's helped me find my glasses while they were on my head. <laughs> Anyone done that? <laughs> no. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I hope they're, even if they're lying, thank you, Lord, for that. He helps us with some of those minor things. And, and I have found keys where I have looked. I've been there. I've looked. They're not there. And I think he just supernaturally puts them there. But man, I, I've learned to pray a lot sooner than later for things. Amen. Why should I struggle to look for keys for two hours when I can say it in a few minutes and there they are. They are. And I give him thanks and praise for that. Now some of you are saying, well, that's ridiculous. It's keys, Brian. He's, he's so holy. We've got to have this holy stuff towards him. He says he'll give me an abundant life. And part of that is I'm not going to worry about finding my keys. Right. Because worry steals my walk with God. Worry takes the joy that I can have walking with God. And it builds my relationship with him because I get a kick out of it every time he does it. I, you just got to chuckle. It's like, Lord, you love me. You find my keys for me. It's just amazing. It's amazing stuff. It's so small, but yet it speaks so loudly. John 14, 12 and 13, they're tied together. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I just share that with you because, again, we say, there's a blank check, and Brian, I've asked for it. I asked for a new house, and it didn't happen. What's wrong with God? But again, it's about your heart, and it's about the intent of what you're asking for. 
Man, if you're asking, I'll give you an example. Uh, we don't have a worship leader <coughs> up at Managa, but we have what's called icing, and it works fine. But this morning uh, before church, I thought, you know, we can get really comfortable with this icing, and I haven't really even looked for a worship leader lately. And so I spent some time in prayer before people came, and I said, Lord, you know, I've kind of set that on the burner, but I, I'm bringing it back to you. We need a worship leader. And I had called this one gal several times, and she never answered back. I thought, hmm, okay, I get the idea. We get home, I check my phone, and she's on the phone saying, can I still do that? You, I haven't got to hold you, but I want to be able to do that. Hallelujah. That's an answer to prayer. I just prayed it. Yes. yes. And it's, I mean, that's why we love being in this new church starting stuff, because you have to rely on him for everything. Everything. You're starting with nothing and everything he brings, whether it's a can of paint or $100 to fix this or whatever it might be. Uh, we're just moving forward slow and sure, but you know what? He's providing what we need. Acts 4, 23 to 31. Let me read this to you. And being let go, they were, uh, this is the disciples, uh, Peter and John, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. They were told not to speak to Jesus. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are a God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David had said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand uh, to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. With boldness. But see, they prayed before this took place. They prayed and gave God the glory and the glory and the glory. Because they were so faithful, even when they were told not to speak of Jesus, it shook the ground. Another part, I believe it's in Acts, when he's talking about the Berean church so accepting, he's in Thessalonica prior to that, a few verses before that, and they're saying, get these guys out of here because they're turning the world upside down. Yeah. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in these people. But it's also the relationship they have with God to be coming to Him and speaking to Him and seeking power and seeking prayer through Him. Now some of you are saying, you know what, Brian, I just don't get all this. The definition of prayer is solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God. But then it's a scary part. It says, or an object of worship. I'll tell you, the, work of the world is worshiping and praying to things that they shouldn't be. So scientifically, this prayer works. Some of you guys are saying, well, I need to know. I need to see it. I need to see it on paper. All right, I got to see it on paper. Well, today there's 101 medical schools that are incorporating patient spirituality in their curriculum. That's up from 17 schools in 1995. They're starting to see the power of prayer. They're seeing mental health uh, issues dissipating. They're seeing physical health improve. 70% uh, of the doctors today believe in miracles, and they're happening today. Uh, some, hope, uh, some people are hoping that more prayer benefits are being, uh, you know, they study them, and some people say, well, yes, it's obvious. I mean, the person's self-worth is up, and they're, they're calm, and they hope their blood pressure is coming down, their heart rates are up, because they have this hope in Christ, and they have the hope through the prayers. But you know what? There's just as many people on the other side saying it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. So I guess if you find someone that says, I don't think prayer works, have them talk to Lazarus, right? Because before Jesus brought him out of the tomb, he prayed to his God. And so we come to realize that prayer can even raise people from the dead. Now when it talks about greater works are going to be done now, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to do anything greater than bringing people from the dead to life. But we're going to do it greater in the project being set of one area of the world. It's all over the world. You're finding Jesus all over the world now on the internet and whatnot. And we can pray for that. I, Brian, I can't travel the world. Fine, then pray for those that are willing to do it. 
Give them the strength of your prayers to be reaching out that they would be shown favor and hedge protection and all that they need, the supplies they need, and that their voices would be amplified across the country. We can sit here right in our coffee shop and do that. We can sit in our home and then do that. We can be in prayer. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Well, know that Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed a lot. Now, we're called to be imitators of Christ. That's true. So if we're going to be imitators of Christ, then should we be praying? Yes, Jesus Christ himself prays. You can go through the Bible, look up prayers or Jesus praying, and you'll find uh, over and over again where he chooses to pray and decides to. Again, in our discipleship course, there was a couple lines in the book that said this. It really rocked me. It said, if prayer was that important for Jesus, who was the sinless Son of God, how much more important is it for us who have the downward pull of sin to contend with as well? So if Jesus, who was sinless, prayed for strength and protection and guidance and that he would be obedient to his Father, how much more should we who struggle in life so easily fall into sin? Matthew 10, 24 and 25 says... A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, and a servant like his master. Sometimes I think if we're saying, well, I don't really need to pray, I got it all handled. We're exalting ourselves higher than Jesus, because Jesus himself would say, I needed to pray. I chose to pray. It strengthened me. Gave me comfort. And so we realize that we want to say, we want to be like our teacher. We want to be like our servant. And so we understand that praying is important. But you say, Brian, I'm just too busy. I'm just too busy. I'm too busy. Well, you're a prophet. You are. You're too busy. If you can't find time to pray. You can't find time not to pray. It's almost as if so many times when I did counseling through the years at the psychiatric hospital, you begin to talk to someone and inventory their life, and, and you would say, well, what do you do to deal with life? How do you stay upbeat in life? You know what I heard all the time? Three words. I used to. I used to exercise. I used to talk to a counselor. I used to go to church. I used to do this. I used to do that. Well, now they're in this dire strait, this depressed state. They're down, down deep. And you realize that they've removed everything that was positive that could help lift them up, especially this idea of stopping going to church. I used to pray. And so we remind them that they need to be putting those positive things back in life. So if you're sitting out here saying, you know what, my life just feels like it's out of control. I feel so depressed. I feel like my emotions are all over the place. Pray. Pray. Many of us have had counselors through the years. The world can give you counselors and they can help you or you can get Christian counselors. And I like that better because they can help you and they use God and they're related to uh, spirituality to do that. But I tell you what, we always have to be just so important focusing on God. We always have to have that because, see, Christ says that I go so that He, meaning the Holy Spirit, may come. And it says that He's a counselor. He's the best counselor you can have. Because He's going to speak nothing but truth to you, nothing but the, what the Father tells Him to speak to you. How many of you are signing up for that one? And guess what? Really, it's free. When you accept Jesus Christ and the gift He gives us, we receive that Holy Spirit. Because we have to be transformed again, remember? We always go back to transformation. I'm sorry if you're sick of me talking about it. But it's the biggest issue is to be able to be transformed from this spot to this spot. It says that we have to have a renewing of our mind. It has to change. And the only way that's going to happen is through prayer to understand what the words are and what the Bible says. Because the world will lie to you and lie to you and lie to you. It'll make you feel so comfortable you're going to say there's no issue at all. Yet you're drowning in the world lacking Christ in your life. But yet, it feels so good and feels so comfortable. This is who I am. This is my life. I, I like it like this. But if it's apart from Christ, I want you to get into prayer and say, Lord, help me to understand. Jesus prayed. He prayed. It was a priority for him. Sometimes it said he prayed in the morning. Sometimes late in the evening after he had a long day at the office, so to speak. He just left 5,000 people. Well, it was 5,000, but you figured children and whatnot. Some have said up to 15,000 that he fed. He has them depart. And then he even tells his disciples, now you get in the boat and you go across. 
go across. And then he goes up to the mountain. It says, when he had sent the multitudes away, Matthew 14, 23, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. What do you think he might say after that huge miracle that took place? And I'm thinking he gave thanks to God and he prayed that, that, that through that movement, that miracle, that some people would come to know uh, Jesus in a greater way and understand that there's a different way to live. There's a new way and it's the better way, it's the right way. So he had a rough day, he had a busy day, but he gave time to God at the end of the day to cleanse himself. Some of us run ragged, we're burning the candle at both ends, we have time, no time to pray. Busy in the morning, busy at night, I barely get any time to do this or that or the other thing. It's so easy to fall away from prayer. Now we're just on our own power. How many of you want to live life on your own power? Man, I did that BC days, before Christ days, failed miserably at it. I don't want that to take place again. So you realize that Jesus at times prayed before something wonderful or miracle happened or after. He prayed before big decisions. He was going to choose the 12 disciples. It says in Luke 6, 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. How many of us have prayed all night lately for anything? Good, Sally. Good for those that have. But we have these huge decisions and we might give that as much prayer as we have. Where's my keys? Or what should I eat today? Huge decisions and we don't include Jesus Christ and his wisdom because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not fear like afraid, but reverence to understand that he wants the best for us. Let's include him in those huge decisions and do it before you make the decision. How many of you know we oftentimes include Christ after the decision's made? Because if we ask him ahead of time and he really answers it, he might say no. Right. Oh Lord, I'm at McDonald's and right over at Norseman's has a pickup that I really want. If you want me to have it before I sign the papers after I eat these burgers, just stop it somehow. I need to go beforehand and say, Dear Lord, Norseman's here. Dear Lord, there's a truck at Norseman's. I need a vehicle. I don't know if I can afford it. You might just want me to have something simple or you might want me to have something nice. I want you to pick that truck for me. I want to be ready for that so I don't hinder me. I don't want to get that pickup and then say, I've got to quit going to church because I need a second job to pay the mortgage on the pickup. So help me have a better understanding of where you want me to be in this situation. Then go to McDonald's and have a burger. Talk to him while you're eating, and he might not answer you for a day, or two, or three. And every day you drive by, the truck's still there. But it's going to go soon. God, it's going to go soon. It's a really good deal. Ever been there? Bargaining with God. Or you buy it, and you say, no, please bless it. I had to get it because it was going fast. I'll tell you what, you... you Taking God out of the whole concept. Big decisions mean big prayers. If you've got a big decision, put some time into that. Show that it's a big thing for you. I wrote down a couple things. Dear Lord, let me know your will. Should I buy this house as you put down a down payment on it? It's a little too late. Dear Lord, should I marry this woman as you buy an engagement ring and plan the wedding? Maybe do that prior to asking someone to marry you. You know, most of us, if we're honest, got married more for lust than love. Unless you were walking with God, unless you understood what God uh, wanted in your life. And did you ask God to help pick the person for you? Or did we find someone that we liked and then try to encourage God to say this? Yeah, 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 you're right, Brian. She's a good one. She's a keeper. And I want that for our young people. Not to make decisions based on themselves, but to include God in that decision. Do you believe God knows who the perfect person for you is out there somewhere? Then pray that you have the patience to wait for that person to come to you, or you come to them. But so often our loneliness and different things take over, and before long it's like, God, you're just taking too much time. You must be really busy. I'll find one. You know? And then we know where that goes. Hmm. So often our prayers are just formalities. Psalms 27, 8 says, when, when you said, meaning Jesus, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, this is one that we've read often. It's powerful because it has so many things. Let's see if it has anything about prayer. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, those two go together hand in hand. You have to humble yourselves to pray and seek my face, as we just read about, 
and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Prayer is one aspect of what was going to take place there. Prayer is one aspect of our life, but if we're going to pray that we live a godly life, then we need to live a godly life. We can't be praying for a godly life and then choosing to do all kinds of ungodly things. But we don't want it to be just repetition, the Bible says. We don't want it to just be rote memory, something that's burned in your brain. I'm, I'm going to challenge you guys. I'm going to ask you to end some sentences for me. We want it to come deep from your heart and not from the surface board that you have. Plot, plot. All right, now how many of you thought of that in the last three years? But it's right there. Red Robin. There you go. Oh, I wish I... Nestle's makes the very best. Chocolate. Come, Lord Jesus. Yes. When you say but. Don't know that one. What? I don't know. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you guys don't know. When you say but, wiser, you've said it all. It's from my PC days. All right. You're in good hands with. Sorry. State Farm. No State Farm. I'd walk a mile for a kill. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. It's pitiful if you pray that way, huh? The best part of waking up in the valley of the jolly Christ <coughs> Aroni. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Keep going. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. How many of you had to put any effort into that prayer versus rice aroni? It just rolls off your tongue. It's burnt in your brain, right? If you're honest, it just rolls off your tongue. Someone says to say it, you just say it. But what we're talking about is you want to mean it. It needs to be something meaningful. Because if I can listen to someone say, Nestle's make the very, and I can come up with chocolate, or, or I wish I was, and we go Oscar Mayer Wiener, it rolls off your tongue. It's just part of who you are. It's in your history. It's in your past. You throw it out there. And so when a pastor says, let's say the Lord's Prayer, you just recite it. You need to mean it. And that's the difference between personal prayer and just saying what you're supposed to say. Too many churches, too many of us, just roll it off our tongue. It doesn't really mean anything to us. It's just something that we remember and we know that it's a godly thing to say. I'm going to close with this, Matthew 6, 5-13. He says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. These are the ones who are just yelling her out there. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. So if their heart is wrong and they're just doing it to show off, he's saying, you know what, that person that just said you pray really cool, that's the reward you got. That's it. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Then the disciples say, well, how should we pray? How should we pray? And He gives us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. See, you could stop there and spend about 15 minutes. You can say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Heavenly Father, you sent your son Jesus Christ to die for me. I can't even fathom that. I'm not worthy of that, Lord, but you made me worthy of that by taking my sin from me. I just thank you, Lord, so much for that. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Heavenly Father, I know this world is a difficult place and I find myself falling into sin and society, Lord. I want to be removed from that. I want to see your will be done in my life, your will to be done in this country. I want to see those things, Lord. And so you go on and on, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, thank you for what you provide for me. We've never starved. We always have heat. We always have lights. Heavenly Father, you know exactly what we need, and sometimes we don't know how we're going to get it, but yet you bring it to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me that much.
Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. You guys said that, right? Yeah. You know what that means? Lord, you treat me like I'm treating other people. Lord, if I'm not forgiving people, you don't forgive me. You just ask him to do that. That's why it ends with saying, well, we need to forgive. We had that sermon on forgiveness quite, quite heavy not so long ago. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Heavenly Father, I know that you can attest me. I know you can put trials in my life. But Heavenly Father, I pray you find me worthy not to need to do that. Lord, I don't want to be anywhere near temptation. If I sense it, I want the Holy Spirit to nudge me that I would remove myself and get away from it so that I don't fall into temptations. I don't want to be with the evil one. Deliver me from that. For yours is the kingdom, Lord, and yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever. Amen. So you can break this... They can break this prayer down. You can take a piece of paper and write the different areas. You know, we're worshiping and we're asking that His will be done and we're thanking Him for what we have. We're asking that we forgive other people. You can put that and then when you make up your own prayers, you can fit it in there so it follows that pattern. Now, it's not wrong to, as we recite that the way He told us to recite it, but there's more prayer than that. And if you're finding yourself just rattling it off like a robot, you're not there. This prayer is nothing. It's nothing yet. You really want to be able to roll it off and think about what you're doing. Now, I know in a corporate thing you need to just say it. But I tell you what, it's so easy for us to bring it to our remembrance, but we don't remember what it's about. We don't remember who we're really praying to and giving the glory for. We're just doing it just like those TV jingles. So I challenge you, the next time you say the Lord's Prayer, whether it's at home or the next time you pray, can you take a look at the Lord's Prayer and try to build it in and use that as an outline to help you give God the glory first and then your needs might come down the road and needs for others. Make sure you don't put yourself first. That's backwards. That's spiritual dyslexia. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, you want nothing but prayer. Lord, you love us and you want that relationship with us. I, I can only imagine how many times in my life alone that you've said, please talk to me before you do that, Brian. Brian, Brian, you're going to do the same thing over again. Please listen. Heed my voice. Talk to me. Talk to your Father. Heavenly Father, I pray that all of us would have that idea that I need to talk to my Father first. I need to talk to my Father today before I start my day. Mornings can be the best, but I know people are busy. But Heavenly Father, help us to make a way somewhere to carve out some time for you. That we look at how long we're on our phone in a day's time. How long we're on Facebook in a day's time. And then how much time we give you to prayer. Or how much time we watch television or play with our animals or take care of this or take care of that. And how much time we give you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we can have the strength that you have for us. We can have all these things, this power to be able to do miracles in your name. But we need to have a close relationship. You don't do that superficially. I can't just have this very shallow relationship with you and wonder why I'm not seeing success in my life. Heavenly Father, you're looking for depth. You're looking for the heart, not just the mind. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would all absorb this, receive it, and Heavenly Father, examine it in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that out of this Cowboy Church group tonight, you're just going to be flooded and inundated with more prayer time for each and every one of us. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Everybody said it. Amen. amen and amen. You guys are praying it's over. Oh, woo, thank you, Lord.